You're listening to a podcast from the Word. Do you know a funny thing? If you、uh, there is a theory that the naming of popular music singing groups, which is always a fascinating study in itself, people tend to pick names that are actually the direct opposite of the world that they're actually in. Classic case. That's good. That's good. I like that theory. Classic case. If you go back to the glory days of kind of Tamla Motown and you know sixties vocal vocal groups, rhythm and blues vocal groups, you know people like the Temptations, they names like the Temptations, the Supremes, the Originals, the Miracles. You know they were all they were all eyes looking to the horizon of a better world, weren't、yeah. they? You know what I mean? Because very often these people came from relatively poor backgrounds, and so. They associate an entertainment with,、uh, you know, the dream that they would like to achieve. On the other hand, if you take kind of、um, the area that I'm now going to draw your attention to, to which is emo. Okay, so this is—I was going to say about this is kind of white middle class students. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Probably you is go. emo. <laughs> so they're deliberately very, depressing landscape. Very comfortable circumstances. Yeah, they yeah, yeah, yeah. Brought yeah. up in, and therefore, when they came to name their group. They had to somehow pretend that they were that life for them was an unmitigated hell. Okay,、Very、so、good. we're talking about emo groups. Okay,、yeah. and I've got five names here. One of them、cool. I've made I、like、up.、Okay. That's good. Here we go. Forever the sickest kids. <laughs> Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, known to their friends as ADHD. Moose blood, funeral for a friend, and something corporate. Okay, forever the sickest kids, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, moose blood, funeral for a friend, and something corporate. Which one's made up? Those are fantastically good. <laughs> They really, those are brilliant. Funeral for a friend, I remember. They're real. Okay. Uh, something corporate. I'm going to take a risk and say that that boring though it is, is the kind of thing that an angry and challenging emo band would call their they call themselves.、Um, so I I don't know. I'm right or wrong, but I'm down to three now, which is and I think I think attention deficit etc etc hyperactivity disorder it was is just is just too complicated.、Uh, And but there were、I'm、no going, there were、I'm、no go- colloquially it was ADHD. Of course they were. Anyway, of course they were. I, I th- I'm going for forever the sickest kids because that's just a brilliant name. <laughs> and, then, and would you, is it? No, you're wrong. No, I, you? I win. You win. You win.、Uh, Moose blood, forever the sickest kids, funeral for a friend, and something corporate were all real. Attention deficit hyper. Oh no, you're kidding. <laughs> Really, I love the way you said breezily. That, of course, they were known as you know. They do, but yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry, that actually sorry. had me. I did no, that. That's superb. That's the, you know, absolutely hoodwink. That's a really good one. But isn't truly the most terrible name there in that list? Something corporate. Something corporate is dreadful. There's no ring to it at all. Is the, Why know, would you, in any circumstances, go and see a band called something something corporate. corporate? Two more from them after the news. Oh, that's dreadful. Yeah. So there you go. All right. Well, look, I've got. I've got five music magazines. Okay, actual,、Whoa. real, physical, printed on paper、Whoa. publications.、Oh, yeah. Right, four of these existed. In fact, some of them still exist. And one is a preposterous ringer, <laughs> confected by me. Okay, so here they are: five music magazines. Number one, the Amazing Pudding. That's real. I think I, I, I shouldn't be doing.、That. Yeah, all right. Number on, two, the、it. Ragtime Ephemeralist. Number three, Ukrainian Gothic Portal. <laughs> Printed, God. Yeah, absolutely. Zippo is the fourth. Oh God. And the fifth one is: Are you scared to get happy? So that's that's five music magazines. Amazing, the amazing pudding, ragtime ephemeralist, Ukrainian Gothic Portal, <coughs> absolutely Zippo, and are you scared to get happy? Jesus, those are good. And they were all actually on paper. My on goodness, paper. on paper. Well, I I'm not familiar with any of them, and so I'm going to take a complete stab in the dark at absolutely Zippo. You're right. <laughs> 
making up the rigor. Yeah, it? right. Actually, actually, I'm, it was actually the name of an anthology of Bay Area punk fanzine. Oh, but right. Okay. Actually, no, but it's not. Okay. It's not. It's a made. It's not a real. It's not. A, not a magazine. That's Just go, go, go through those names again. Well, they are the Amazing Pudding, and you're absolutely you see right. the Amazing That's Pudding. Real. They're they're all they're all kind of got the uh, got the air of kind of stoned in jokes. You, yeah. you call it that, you know. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, go on. What are the other? The Amazing Pudding was a British. Uh, was a, a British Pink Floyd fancy. That's from eighty three right. to ninety three. I can remember this. The Ragtime Ephemeris, e Ephemeralist, which I think is a really wonderful name. You kind of imagine there must have been a magazine in I don't know the nineteen twenties or something called that. But no, it was it was it was published. It was, it's a, obviously about ragtime music, put together by a cartoonist and ragtime aficionado called Chris Ware, and the first issue was published in nineteen ninety eight. Uh, in Oak Park in Illinois, and he's so far produced three issues in 22 years. <laughs> Isn't that what, it's such a lovely name for a that's title, a, the Ragtime Ephemeris. I'd love to read that. That's the kind of magazine you like to work for, isn't it? Three issues. Three in issues in 22 20 years. years. Oh, God, it's press day coming up. Oh, no. <laughs> it's press year. It's as a dawn. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Yeah, Ukrainian Gothic portal is real. Obviously, it is a portal, but it's also as though there is a printed version of this magazine. It's a promotional agency of Gothic, dark, electro music in Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus. Started in 1990. Still going, actually. Go. 1999. And the last one was Are You Are You Scared to Get Happy? Which is a Bristol fanzine in 85 to 87 by two guys called Matt Haynes and Mark Carnell. And it was full of bands like Biff Bang Pow and the Jasmine Minx. So you would have been a subscriber, though. Yeah, so there you are. But well done. Now you rumbled me. You oh, win. Well, oh, very, well. very good. We both won. So um, what's been happening this week? Well, Dylan's been happening. My God, Dylan's song catalogue. When was that announced? On Monday, was it? Something like that. So yeah. Dylan, Dylan's song catalogue, uh, it was announced as uh, has been sold to Universal Music. This is the song rights, the publishing rights, not, not the recordings. Yeah. Um, for I think the New York Times estimated nobody knows three hundred million dollars. I hate the way those sums are always rounded up to the nearest hundred million. It's either two hundred million or three or four hundred well, million. They probably are done like that, aren't they? In real terms, I don't know. I don't well, know I'd love to know how much it was. I mean, he actually he was offered supposedly four hundred million dollars by hypnosis. Who are the uh, the people who bought up uh, well, a huge number of catalogs recently? So yeah. I'm I'm thinking if he was if he turned down four hundred million, if any of this is true, he probably got more than that from Universal. But who knows? Because New York Times <coughs> New York Times said that Stevie Nicks was said to have sold a part of her rights to her songs, yeah, for eighty million, which which made me think, my God, if they've got Bob Dylan's catalog for three hundred million, they got it quite cheap. You know. Well, he's absolutely. And, and no, we were talking to Tim Rice, weren't we, on Monday or Tuesday of last week, and uh, for a word in your attic, very, very good one too. And yes, if, if you haven't seen, if you haven't seen that, oh, you do check that out. As I believe there's on the radio. <laughs> But Tim Rice was saying, and he knows a bit about this, he's saying that even if they paid $300 million for Bob Dylan's catalogue, he said they'd expect to make that money back in between 10 and 12 years. Amazing. He also pointed out that Dylan himself, of course, is a sole author of nearly every single yeah, one of those songs. Which makes a huge Music and, and, and uh, lyrics are, are by Bob Dylan. There are a few exceptions. But broad, I mean, can you make so Lennon McCartney is only 50%, isn't it, or whatever? Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's a huge amount of money. It is. But, and I can really see why people are staying in the catalog. I'm sorry, I can't. A, these are uncertain times. You know, nobody's quite sure what the revenue opportunities are going to be if touring may be threatened, you know. And uh, and B, you know, he's the age he is, he's 79. And if you're presented with a big, hard lump of cash at this stage of your life, uh, you know, on the table, you'd probably want to take it. But also, if you sell it to an agency like that, then they're going to work your catalog. It's in their interest to really go out and promote it, isn't it? To it sell is. that stuff as much as possible rather than sit back and wait for the telephone to ring and someone say, um, wait for the telephone to ring, God, I'm old fashioned. <laughs> uh, and, and ask for someone to say, is it all right if we use this in this soundtrack or whatever? I mean, they're actually, we'll be punting his stuff out. Well, I imagine there'll be adverts with, with Dylan soundtracks. In it. Yeah, I, I don't, it, it's interesting to speculate, really, because um, presumably if he gets 300 million, he can actually sit down with his... How many children has he got? It's four, is it? No, well, no, it's, sorry. I think no, it's no, more there's, four, four. there's four by Sarah, isn't it? No, seven, I think it's this, right? Well, okay, so a few. Yeah. <clears throat> and and he can pretty much sit there with a 
big old pile of cash on the kitchen table. Like, again. Don't spend it all there, at once. There you are. Now, now, do not argue. You know what I mean? Yeah. So at least he has the peace of mind of knowing that some of them will have pissed away a fortune, whatever. But it won't be his problem. Absolutely. They, they won't be arguing about his will or his legacy. Or yeah. Whatever. There it is. Um, but, you know, you talk about uncertain times. I think there's another way of looking at this, you know, because what drives this is, is buyer interest, not seller interest. It's buyer interest. It's our people going round wanting to buy music catalogs. Yes, they are. You know, so as you said, Hypnosis, the company that shares the same name as the old sleeve design company, but has nothing to do with them, um, we, who are going around spending a lot of money on buying music catalogs. And so are the existing music publishers. If you were to look around the world of business generally right now in these uncertain times, I-T-U-T. I'm surprised nobody's turned it into an acronym by now. Uh, you would you look at all the things you could invest your money in, you know, I don't know, transport, manufacture, catering, leisure, travel, whatever. Those are all very, very uncertain businesses. The business one business that is not uncertain is the use of music sent down phone lines or through the air on films, on TV programs, on commercials, on things yet to be born, that's proven to be a very, very secure business. Oh, it's, it? uh, that's absolutely right. <laughs> and, no, uh, it's you know, uncertain for the people yeah, making the music, the people yeah, who don't well, go out and play. Oh, absolutely. That's yeah. definitely bad. But, but um, you know, the, the, you might not want to invent, in, invest your money in a, in a chain of cinemas at the, right at this point. You might not invent, want to invest it in a new TV channel. But would you invest it in the thing that they're all going to need and will continue to pay for? Yes, you probably will. Yeah, you would. Absolutely. Now, whether Tim, you know, I'm sure Tim you know, knows a lot more about it than, than we do. You know, and if he says 10 to 15 years or whatever is, is the time that take to get their money back. I mean, I, it's, it's always very difficult to know, isn't it? How much money do people earn out of songs? But I happened to meet somebody a couple of weeks ago who told me that, and I won't name him or the song, but he is he is a beneficiary. I think his grandfather, or maybe his great grandfather, anyway, descend and uh, one of his antecedents, wrote a very popular song of the First World War, really popular song, which will, will have sold a lot of sheet music in its day, and will have been a, you know recorded many, many innumerable times. You and, told me about it. He co-wrote it, actually, didn't he? You didn't oh, well, whatever. Okay. So, yeah. He, so, but he said it was about to go go out of copyright, but current up till recently, he's been getting £50,000 a year out of that. Isn't that amazing? That's a, that's that's the, a lot of cash. It's the plot 50, line for, for About a Boy, isn't it? There's 50, some jingle somewhere that's still paying back. £50,000 a year. One song, which it's is not even, not even a particularly Half a credit. song. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, and so this whole business of the um, of the extension of copyright is a really interesting thing. Is that well, because Rhapsody in Blue is about to come into the public domain, isn't it? Well, uh, it, okay. And I think Great Gatsby, I mean, that's a book thing, obviously, but I think that's the same in January 2021. So, so what, uh, tell, uh, tell me the definition there, because in the UK, it used to be, and I'm entirely wrong, across Europe, that copyright in books, plays, music, works of art, films comes to an end 70 years after the author's death. Really good example being Beatrix Potter, who died in 1943. I can remember her copyright coming up in, what it was, 2014, I think, and there being a huge amount of kind of excitement about the merchandise possibility for Beatrix Potter, you know, that you didn't have to pay it some kind of copyright. On it. But is it different in America, then? I think it is. It must be. It, it, must, is. it must be longer, mustn't it? It is. Well, it, it's different in Britain over different things. Yeah. So I, I'm reading off the government site at the moment. So a written, dramatic, musical, and artistic work, yeah. copyright lasts 70 years after the author's death. The sound music, sound and music recording, is 70 years from when it's first published, i.e., re released. Yeah. So that's a different thing. So if people are arguing about you know, whether, I don't know, an Elvis Presley recording from the 50s is out of copyright. Well, you know, as far as uh, as far as 
the, that's concerned. It could be 70 years from when it's first published. But the song, the copyright only starts from 70 years after the um, after the author dies, you know, so it can be. It's a, it's a very complicated business. Made more complicated in the United States by the fact that the big rights holders have, over a long period of time, done everything they can to extend copyright. So if you want to know why <laughs> Hollywood traditionally has spent so much time schmoozing on Capitol Hill, that's the thing that they're always wanting. They're always saying, can we add another 20 years on here so that Disney's, I don't know, Snow White and Seven Dwarfs can can remain in copyright you know, for another 20 years longer. And one of the strongest proponents of this and most successful proponents of this was, you may remember, Sonny Bono. Yeah. Sonny Bono was a Republican congressman, wasn't he? Yeah. And he, he sponsored what became known as Sonny Bono's Act for the extension of copyright, which was very successful. Now, apparently, this is... The tide has started to turn over this over the last 10, 20 years because of hip hop and remix culture and you know the idea that everything is made out of earlier things. And so there is less appetite in Congress for the, uh, for the extension of copyright than there was in the latter part of the 20th century. So it may, it may have come to an end uh, then. But, uh, you know, out of copyright from next year, because they died in 1950, George Orwell, so help yourself to Animal Farm 1984, blah, blah, and so forth, and also George Bernard Shaw, who died in 1950. Died in 1950, yeah, he did. Uh, and so, I don't know, there's probably not the same, probably not the same uh, appetite for Man and Superman and Major Barbara, whatever. Um, not piping know, up. Not quite. Because Pygmalion was his big thing, which was turned into My Fair Lady. And so you'd have to look at when the copyright of My Fair Lady goes from, you know, because that'll go from when Lerner and Lowe died, which will presumably, I don't know when that was. But if a song comes out of copyright, so just to be clear, what does that mean? It means that you can do a recorded version of it and not pay a royalty? How does that work? I think you can do it without having to seek any permission from uh, the... Um, from the originator or the but, holder of but the But can't right. you do that? You can't do that anyway. So if you wanted to cover a Bob Dylan song, obviously you've got to go to Bob Dylan's publisher and agree an amount of money for the right to... to, to There's pay. a standard right to... Uh, I, listen, that's, that's surely I, they're, not gonna, they're not going to say you can't record Bob Dylan's song. They, they, you, they might, they might do the if you... They, they, might, do that. they might do if your name's Adolf Hitler or, or you know, if you're planning to do something with it that didn't like. Who knows? What possible. That's it's possible. possible. Yeah. I think those things do come up. Listen, I don't really know is the truth. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's largely about the money. Uh, starting next year, you can help yourself to Gene Autry's Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, which was one of the big hits in 1950. And also Nat King Cole's Mona, Mona Lisa. Mona Lisa. Yeah. And a personal favourite of mine, the third man theme by Anton Karras, you know, which we all know the famous, uh, you know, the last waltz, <laughs> the last waltz, which later on, you know, which, which the, the band did, did later on. So it's a, it's a fascinating area. And of course, one of the things that we're reminded of by talking to Tim Rice is when he looks at this stuff, he's probably thinking less about Jesus Christ, superstar and, and Evita and so forth. And thinking more about Joseph and his amazing Technicolor dream coat. Because the thing that goes on forever is anything that kids do. School plays. School plays. Go yeah, on it's true. Forever. If, you, if you put on J Joseph at your school play, your primary school, you've got to pay. You've you got to pay. I don't know. God knows what you have to pay. No, a mate of mine did a, his daughter read a play about... Um, about uh, uh, Nico from the Velvet Underground recently, a really small scale thing on a little fring fringe theatre circuit. Very few people, very small audiences, but they still have to clear and pay for the rights to use one of the Velvet Underground songs that Nico sang. And uh, so th those revenues are still going. And if, yeah, as you say, schools are a pretty rich source of cash, aren't they? Yeah, well, it's not huge sums, but if you've got, if you've got thousands of them, you know, it, it, it mounts up. 
but you know, it comes back to the other thing, going back to what Tim said about, you know, 10 to 15 years to get the money back. You know, you've got to think of this in the light of, uh, I'll tell you what RL mate Jonathan Morris said to me, and Jonathan Jonathan is, uh, works, uh, you know, for the, for the big collection agencies, MCPS, PRS, you know, the people who look, in, look after make sure musicians and songwriters get paid for every radio play and all the kind of exposure they get. He says, if you, if you wrote a big hit in the mid-60s, it would be paying more now than it paid then. Absolutely. For the, for the simple reason that there are far more outlets nowadays. So when, you know, when Why's Your Shade of Pale came out, how many radio stations were there in Britain? A hand, handful. How many are there now? Thousands. You know, and it's not just radio stations. It's shops playing stuff, people playing anything to the public, things being used on, online, on games, on TV programs or whatever. So, you know, as the I always of- mention the Andrew Ridge- Ridgely factor because Andrew Ridgely has a co credit on one, I think possibly two Wham songs. One of the things last Christmas. And as far as I can see, Andrew Ridgely has had a very comfortable, uh, a very relaxed, and very unstrenuous life ever since. Yeah. I'm not, I don't get the impression he does anything particularly for a living apart from, from, from uh, survive on those royalties. So they must be pretty substantial. Yeah. So, anyway, the, you know, the great learning of this is Gene Autry's Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. Fill your boots. <laughs> the Word Podcast. Prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. Can yeah. I just say that during that negotiation for the Bob Dylan catalogue, do you think they even bothered to offer anything at all for Tweedledum and Tweedledee? <laughs> do they say we actually don't want it? Right, so all along the watchtower, $10 million. <laughs> Tweedledum, no, we're not taking it. No, no, you can keep that. Wiggle, wiggle, you can have it. <laughs> Oh they pushed it back across the negotiation oh, time. No. Yeah. So I was just thinking further to that conversation. Now, I mean, we'll never know how much anybody makes out of this stuff, but one of the most powerful lobbies behind the American efforts to extend copyright have been the descendants of George and Ira Gershwin, you know, the Gershwin yeah. grandchildren, whatever, distant nephews, I don't know. And um, if, if the guy I met... I was talking about makes 50 grand a year out of one song from the first world war. How much possibly do the Gershwin family make out of Rhapsody and blue, Porgy and Bess, summertime an American in Paris. I got rhythm, embraceable you, someone to watch over me, a foggy day, fascinating rhythm. Love is here to stay. Lady be good. Blue Monday. It ain't necessarily so, and so on, and so on. You don't and have to get up that early imagine, in the morning, do you? No. Imagine how much money Unbelievable quantities of cash. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and all, all benefiting people who had nothing to do with the original. Because you know, the, the, uh, the argument is always made in, in, in defense of the, the starving artist in the garret. You know, well, actually, these people... That, the people who are benefiting from these are, are banks, investment vehicles, and you know distant re- relatives who had nothing to do with the original you know, generation of the tune. You know, it's just one of those things. Anyway, it's fascinating. So Taylor Swift, Taylor, Taylor Swift. Swift just put out another record during. Well, she's done two, isn't she? Did so one, we, d- one we didn't April, even May. We didn't yep. even know about this record last week when we did the podcast. And now it's it's kind of been and gone, isn't it? It's been right? and gone. Well, it's, it's, I'm, not, I'm afraid to say to my eternal shame, I haven't heard any of it, but amazing reviews. Although you do get you get the impression sometimes that the people are reviewing. Say, are, are they reviewing the event itself or are they yeah, reviewing the record? I'm sorry. Can I just say, uh, this is what, was, <laughs> you know, the, 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 uh, you know, the record came to the reviewers at the same time as it came to the public. And they're presumably... So they're in a mad rush to get their first review out, you know, well, which has got to be, can I just listen to this once in, in, in 20 minutes and just skim through it and write something? I don't, I don't see why anybody needs a review of it because it's there, it's online, you can listen to it. You know, you know you're not deciding whether to buy it or not, are you? No, the value of reviews used to be, I've heard this, but you, 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 <laughs> you haven't heard it yet. So, uh, but, you know, but it's listen, out in two weeks. If you tell, here is what I've learned from years of reviewing records and watching people re- reviewing records. If you tell somebody that they've only got an hour to listen to an, and write something about a review, it will be in 99 out of 100 cases really favourable. 
because they haven't organized their thoughts to be unfavorable. And because it would be, you know, it's, it's regarded as really unfair to dismiss a record on the basis of one hearing, but entirely fair to praise a record on the basis of one hearing. That's absolutely fine. And, and we all know about pop records. They all sound great at first, don't they? Yeah, the only, you've got to you live only, with them. You only know whether they're any good seventh time, sixth time, or whatever. That's when you think, no, this is growing in my affection, or no, this is just, you know, it's not as good as I thought. And nobody it was. wants to be the first one to kind of uh, puncture the balloon, no, and sort of, you know, because there's an excitement in, in terms of the news story itself. Yeah, oh, she's yeah. put an album out. We didn't know anything about it. All done so it's in secret, you know. So you don't want to be the first one to say, yeah, but it's rubbish. So yeah. everyone's kind of bought into the idea that this is a, an event, isn't it? They're, yeah, they're, they're broadly reviewing the event, I think, although I'm sure the record's really good. Yeah, no, that's fair. That's enough. what happened within in Rainbows in 2007, wasn't it? I mean, which, which was actually, to be fair, again, a, a really good record. But all the all the attention was about the fact that they they'd released it the way they released it the honesty box and they started all this really i suppose so yeah. so you know yeah reviews written in haste are always favorable in my and she's experience. also very clever i think she's got that little suppressed spin about her boyfriend the boyfriend has co-written clever. some songs isn't he uh what's his name joe alwyn that's right he's co-written three songs under the name william bowery and she's appeared in a promotional photograph for that in a, in a dress that could be construed as a wedding dress. And then she has started and refused to deny rumours that they've had a secret marriage. I mean, that's just brilliant publicity, don't you think? She's it just keeps good. the pots boiling. She's brilliant. very good at it. <laughs> no, she is. No, about, no, no doubt about it at all. What else were we going to talk about? It's it. Ian Stewart died um the institute died 19 uh he was, he was 47 years old 1985 he died at the age of 47 ian stewart what a story isn't he the guy was the sixth member of the rolling stones whose face didn't fit it's and lulu goldman decided quite literally <laughs> well it, yeah he was he was the guy who um you know they recruited into the the rolling stones um I think I think they auditioned him. It was that pub on the corner of uh, oh god, Brewer Street, Powell Street, whatever. I can't remember what it's called. They hired a room above there, and uh, and I think this was Brian Jones, Mick Jagger, and uh, Keith Richards, and uh, and he came along, parked his bike outside. I think they said, and uh, and came upstairs and played the old pub piano. It was just a brilliant, a brilliant piano player, brilliant kind of barrel house R and B piano player. Worked at ICI, ICI, I think. Had uh, was was probably married with a family, <laughs> slightly older, certainly more settled than they were. And they they he never looked like a member of the band, though, did he? No, well, uh, yeah, they probably hadn't worked that out at that point. No, he still always had his uh, that, hair that, brilliant that, teened back. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And he was Scottish, and. Um, and uh, I think the reason they hired him, apart from the fact he's a fantastic player, hired is probably the wrong word because they were just forming, was that he, he had access to a van and he had access to a very rare resource in 1961 or wherever it was, a telephone. Because that's right, he, he had an office job. So it was Bill Wyman who had the van, actually. Oh, was it? Okay. So that's why he got the job, I think. Yeah. And... Uh, and, uh, you know, so that was hugely important. And he was very much an important part of their sound. And if you look at it, you know, if you look at those early pictures of the six-piece Rolling Stones, he really does not fit. He not at all. He doesn't look right at all. It looks as if he's come straight from work. And he, he had this, um, Keith Richards talks about it, I think, in his book. He had the jaw like William Bendix. You remember William Bendix, the Hollywood actor? Was always played a bit of like a Dan pod. Dare. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I was shutting just, out. Desperate yeah. Dan. Yeah, that's desperate right. Dan. That's it. Yeah. And uh, and and when Andrew Oldham signed them to to Decca, he said to them, six is too many." He he'd worked with the Beatles, and he even thought more than four was too many, really. But but they are essentially a five a five piece concept, don't they? The Rolling Stones is what we what we've grown used to. And so and so Ian Stewart was told he would no longer be required to play with them, but he could he could sometimes play with them behind a curtain. On and stage. the amazing thing is that he accepted that. 
Don't you think that's extraordinary? Because, I mean, anyone else would think, oh, this is the most ignominious, miserable, humiliating thing. I've been told I, I, I don't fit. Physically, I don't look right. They don't want me in the group, but I'm allowed to appear. But no, he stayed on as they kind of tall. And he drove the van and he worked he for the did band, everything. And he played piano on a lot of the Absolutely. Those early hits, records, didn't he? Loads of records. Yeah. Loads of uh, Well, I, I, famously, actually, not just Rolling Stones records. There's a fantastic Led Zeppelin jam from what's he called from physical graffiti called Boogie with Stew. That's right. Just absolutely because he was known as Stew. And then he died in a doctor's waiting room. In, Weren't you uh, with the Stones or with Jack or something on the day I it happened? Were you interviewing the Stones or? on that day? I think it was that day or maybe the day after. It was very, yeah. very near. And uh, it was, um, yeah, we were, uh, me and Mike Appleton were talking to them about program we were making for whistle test and we had a meeting down at um the stones office in cheney walk uh back then and it had just happened and uh, and you know they were all they were all rattled by it. they were all shaken by it, you know but because it seems such a long time ago now it is such a long time ago um you know because the the rolling stones kind of second life it proved to be longer than their first one, isn't it? You know. But they treated all those people so well, the Stones. You've got to give them credit for that. You know, treated well, yeah, really certainly. well. They treated Andrew Oldman, Oldham really well. Yeah, they, yeah. They paid him a. I think he was on a percentage, wasn't he? I mean, he's still. I, never I, to I, I don't. I don't know. But he said he works. You know, the, I think he does things in and around the Stones to this day. Yeah. And the, you know, so there is <clears throat> some kind of relationship there. I think I can't get over is that. Uh, is that the guy who replaced Bill Wyman in the Rolling Stones, Daryl Jones, yeah. replaced him as much as anybody can as a live player, has now been with the Rolling Stones longer than Bill Wyman. I know, it's astonishing, isn't it? And <laughs> no one can really remember his name. <laughs> Daryl Jones. Daryl Jones, I know, that's right. Well, they don't include him in pictures, do they? No. When they do pictures, they do the four-piece Rolling Stones, which look wrong. Four members of the Rolling Stones. It just doesn't look it doesn't right. Doesn't feel right. <laughs> you, you ought to get, get Bill in for the photographs and say, "All right, Bill, you can go off now." You know, just keep there in the pictures. I agree with you. Completely. Doesn't look right at all. No. This is a junction in the Word podcast. It separates that bit from this next bit. And now we're joined by Alexander Gold, who's been up all night again watching Marvel films and listening to old Bob Dylan records, aren't you? You're slowly working your way through the Bob Dylan catalogue, belatedly. Well, I, via your over oversexed, overpaid book playlist, Dave, actually. Uh, all right. You all those don't need to plug that, but go on now. Um, and, yeah, last night I listened to uh, Bringing It All Back Home, and this is very disciplined, isn't it? Because you're listening to these records in the dark, in bed, with the headphones on, right? Yep. So total no, concentration. Absolutely. I want to dedicate myself fully to the listening experience. I realised that I haven't actually sat down and listened to an album properly while, you know, not doing anything else in years. And this is from someone who, who professes, apparently, to love music. So, <laughs> there you go. That's yeah. It. You know, <laughs> go, go figure. But it was it was transcendent transcendent. It was just completely. I mean, it blew my mind. Just you know, um, just being inside that record and 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 being able to see kind of what he was singing about as he was singing it, and you know, just being able to see the picture he painted. It's a wonderful way to listen. It really, really is. And uh, I think it could go far. So, so <laughs> am, I, am I right in thinking that this is last night? Yeah that you heard Mr. Tambourine Man as done by Bob Dylan. For the first time? For the first time. No, I'd heard that one before. And oh, but okay. some of them you some of them you'd not heard before. Obviously Subterranean Homesick Blues I've, I've loved for many years and Maggie's Farm I know and all that right. but, but, uh, Bob Dylan's uh, 115th dream. Right? Yeah. Had you, had you heard Gates of Eden before? Nope, I hadn't heard that before. I hadn't heard, uh, hadn't heard you belong to me before. Um and it was just I, I, yeah, I just, just, I just, I just realised how much, how much value, um, the, the, the act of sitting down and really listening, not just hearing, but listening to an album, a good one, a really good. We see, we see the valuable, the, the precious bit in the experience, as I've droned on about many times and written about 
in books, the valuable, precious part of the experience is not the music, because there's tons of music. The difficult bit is your attention. Yeah. <laughs> and you've got to decide that you, you give it that. Do you know what I mean? We can all have all the tunes in the world, which we half listen to. But I think now more than any, ever, it's it's a question of training yourself to be able to give that attention. Again. Absolutely. Completely. Because before there weren't all those other distractions. And it was, you know, that's what you did in the evenings. You sat down when we were kids. You sat down, you listened to an, an entire record in its entirety and turned it over halfway through and listened in silence a lot of the time, appreciatively. So uh, there wasn't any reason to be texting anybody or wondering what was on the telly. Well, also, you didn't have many records. So, yeah. so you know, you listened to the six records you had. <laughs> you weren't thinking, oh, what shall I choose from, you know, Spotify's endless selection box of things I could be listening to. Yeah. So your attention is the precious bit of the experience. So, you know, that's the thing that, that will will continue to repay. Um, and it very often doesn't matter how good the record is. If you If you give yourself to it, you'll get something from it generally speaking. Don't you yeah. think that's true? It's, it's, it's the act of being present, isn't it, I suppose? It is. Absolutely present. And that's so what, what's next, Alex? What's on for tonight? I'm, I'm going to have to open your book, Dave. Uh, <laughs> I haven't got you don't that. have to take the guidance of my book. You're allowed to. Well, it's, 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 it's my training piece, you know? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, we shall look, look forward to hearing more. Yeah, we want to, we've got a constant update. So, I've just got to mention the... the uh, if anyone listening hasn't read it, it's really worth it's really worth looking at. Actually, I think by a guy called Ian Leslie, who I think is a yeah, it's a it's a it's a, a, a British journalist, has written a thing called Sixty Four Reasons to Celebrate Paul McCartney, which is terribly good, I think. And you're reminded of all sorts of extraordinary things about McCartney. One of which was Monday, the fourteenth of June, nineteen sixty five. Go on, go on. To get any, any well, is this where he did the famous kind of uh, you know trifecta of uh, you know? Three songs in Brilliant. wildly different. Brilliant, though. Wildly, brilliant. absolutely spot on. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he did. I, I, I still think it's astonishing. He, they did. The Beatles did. I've just seen a face. Yes. They recorded in Which six is takes. Kind of fast, jazzy, acoustic. You know, doesn't sound like anything else they ever did. Not at all. And they did it in six takes and finished it. They then did in seven takes. I'm down. Which is completely different table. vocal delivery. You know, that kind of a man buys ring, woman throws it away, same doesn't same happen, old every thing day. happen every day. Screaming at the top of his voice. Absolutely. It is, full it is arguably the most rocking record the Beatles ever made. It's, I think it is. It's, it's wild. Incredible. Their version it, of it at Shea Stadium, which they, in fact, they end the set with Home Down. It's with it, Lennon playing that keyboard. It's, it's got a little really rich of pastiche, but it's just brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. And then, having done all that in two takes, he recorded yesterday. And at 10 o'clock in the evening, he was in a bar with Jane Asher on the Cromwell Road. I mean, that is a day's work, isn't it? Don't you think that's astonishing? Those are finished versions of those songs. They're not sitting there getting a drum sound, are they? No, 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 no. No, they're also the other interesting thing was that the Obladi, Obladara is an expression from the uh, the Yoruba tribe in Kenya, meaning life goes on, which I didn't know. I thought we just made that up, actually. But uh, no, I thought there was a, just a really, there's a really touching story about Cynthia Lennon. Cynthia Lennon obviously had a load of um, artifacts and ephemera, John Lennon-related, Beatles-related stuff. And towards the latter stage of her life, she a little bit of insolvency crept in, and she put some of the stuff up for auction. One of the things she put up for auction was a letter from John Lennon, where he talks about their on tour, and he talks about missing her and missing Julian. And it's a really sweet, really touching letter. And uh, she put this up for sale, and it got an inordinate amount of interest massive, massive amounts of money being bid, eventually sold to an uh, anonymous bidder. And uh, a week later, there's a knock on her door and a delivery man turns up and delivers the letter back to her in a frame with a little note saying, this belongs to you and it belongs to Julian. And I want you to have it. Paul McCartney. I don't think that's sweet. So he, <laughs> bought, he bought it he off. He bought the... it anonymously at the auction so he could give it back to her. Yeah. Doing that's a great story. It is a fantastic story. Very touching. <laughs> and, uh, and um, you know, the, 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 the 64 things, to, whatever it's called, uh, 64 reasons to celebrate Paul McCartney, which are all little anecdotes yeah. like that, aren't they? Just, again, illustrates just 
the level of kind of complexity and detail in the Beatles story that is not in anybody else's story. You couldn't do that about anybody else. No. And that's just about one member, you know. But I suppose also it's um, it's it's an example of the fact that people people's love of Paul McCartney goes beyond the Beatles and often started beyond the Beatles, which is something we've discussed from time to time on these, uh, you know, in pe with people we've talked to, you know, Pete Pavides and people like that. Yeah. Who came to the Beatles later on via wings or as a solo act i love that it's one of the best things about pete's fantastic book broken creek is his analysis of what the beatles sounded like when he was however old he was at the time 11 or something because you know we're used to people being looking at them with a kind of adult perspective and yeah. analyzing them and how they fit into our lives and how they fit into music generally a kind of rock critic uh, yeah. take yeah. on it but you know, he was just listening to their songs as a child and, yeah. and making a completely different sense of them. And I think that was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, what a good uh, book that is. That is, is. Well, yeah. So definitely, both worth worth reading. They are. Um, so, any other business, Alex? What's going on? What have we got going on? We've had a busy week on the word in your attic front, oh, yeah. haven't we? We've, we've uh, had do Danny Baker and Tim Rice in the same week. We, in the same week and Muriel Gray, which and I think Muriel is still... Gray, which is not, I don't think that's gone out yet, has it? No, no it hasn't. Very good. But Danny, good. we revisited Danny <laughs> because we thought, let's do a couple of people we've already done, but let's do them in the run up to Christmas and let's pick people who we think are big on Christmas. So we did Danny, and Danny is huge on Christmas, isn't he? Absolutely enormous. On Christmas, he starts <laughs> counting down, doesn't he, from Boxing Day onwards. Three hundred sixty-four <laughs> days to go. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> and the other Has one, he been? Was, yeah. <laughs> so that that's still there. And if you haven't seen it, you know, we'll put we'll put that link underneath there. That's on YouTube. And uh, and the other one we recorded yesterday, which we we, we thought let's go back to Joe Kendall. She uh, is fantastic. <laughs> Joe Kendall is a, a writer for, for, for Prog Magazine and classic, uh, classic rock and various other things. She's just such good value, isn't she, Dave? She's just so she's, funny. She's got an object to, to suit every occasion, hasn't she? Yeah. She, and, um, and uh, yeah, she, so she had a staggering array of uh, old Christmas pantomime programmes. Oh, they're amazing. Yeah. She's seen Ian McKellen. She's seen, uh, you know... Um, uh, Priscilla Presley. In Priscilla Panto. Presley. That's amazing, isn't it? And, and she all... also had it, which I thought was pretty good, was she had a, a, a David Bowie Monopoly set. So yes. uh, that's that's <laughs> worth. Can't be any of those around. I just got an email from her actually because I I emailed her after to say thanks very much. That was brilliant, and she said that was great. I'm saying uh, I had one item left to chat about if there was time. The picture of me and Melvin Brick. <laughs> wow. God, save that for another one. I'd love to know what, how did that happen. Because <laughs> she, she, the, the 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 high point on the previous one that she did was she had a picture of uh, Ian Ogilvy and a horse. Didn't she? Yes, she did. She just goes, "There's a picture of Ian Ogilvy and a horse next to whatever." It's her ideal word of your attic guest. They've just got loads of stuff. There's something to say about everything. I can't but, think. There's a television program she should be presenting. Actually. Oh God, absolutely. Definitely. Called something like Joe Kendall's Museum of, um, of <laughs> Strange Pop Ephemera yeah, or something, absolutely. you know, and it's just every every second she's whipping some amazing item up. On the so we also, this week, we, we recorded uh, a chat with Muriel Gray, who was up in Glasgow where it's cold and dark, so she, she did the interview in bed. <laughs> that's a bit of a word in your attic first, wasn't it? She was really good. Uh, we've yeah, done done nearly a hundred of these by now. How, how many have we done, Alex? We are on number eighty-nine, I think. Okay, so it won't be long before we've done one hundred. Fireworks will have to be let off for the hundred. Absolutely, it's got to be a special. Um, and so, patrons. sorry, say again. We have some new patrons. Oh, All right. right, okay. Welcome to new members to the parish. Uh, there is Joe Brown, Roger England, Roger. Excellent. Ian Sorry, I missed that again. Ian Fennick. Ian Fennick. Very, very good. good. Alex Peters, great first name. Uh, <laughs> Phil Kinderman and okay. annual patrons. Bear in mind, an annual uh, patron subscription gets you 15% off. There is All right. David Well Beloved. All right. Peter Zeck, uh, Guy Constance, Chris Coleman, and Kipper Williams. 
Kip, uh, right. well, Liam. Well, old friend of ours. We still have to see if we can get a we can get a word in your birthday. We have to do a birthday, uh, uh, and, you know, with a connection with him, you know, because that's part of the deal if you're an annual patron, isn't it? Absolutely. But I think we can come yes, to a, a word absolutely. down your digital chimney and look at your record collection. Yeah, so there are very, very, very good fun. Uh, very different, various different levels in which you can involve yourself on Patreon. Uh, and the and the top level is we we do come in, in indeed and uh, notionally visit your attic on the occasion of your birthday and we did one of those this week didn't we we did we with did. Uh, with Sandra in yeah, uh, Sandra Austin in uh, in uh, Northern Ireland who's, in Northern who's, Ireland who was really really <laughs> she was terribly good oh my you. goodness she was good <laughs> very very good indeed um, so there's all this stuff going on and if you if you want to make sure that you don't miss any of it. And you get it all of it, and you get it early. And in the case of this, you get it in vision, whereas other people just get it in audio. Um, if you go to patreon.com, word in your ear, uh, and we'll put that address under this, you can find out all about it. And we'd be delighted to, uh, to have you join us. Alex, over to you. We should probably also mention that uh, we're doing a word in your attic annual for Patreon. Oh, <laughs> oh yes, we are. Yeah, we are. We are. Yes, we're going to visit a children's hospital. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> we're going to, Mark and I are going to sit around a Christmas tree uh, with cardigans on, you know, and uh, and uh, and going to stir the cocoa and sing, "Have yourself a merry little Christmas." Uh, we'll, yeah, but it will be it will be exciting. So that will be something purely and exclusively for Patreon supporters. So you know, we'd love to have you join them. And uh, you know why not do it? Why not? Why not buy a, a present for the person you love best at this special time of the year? And who's that person, Mark? It's yourself, the old gag. It works, doesn't it? This podcast was brought to you by the Word. Hey.